Hi, I'm Joyce Krieger and this is ArtLink, conversations with artists and art professionals. My guest today is Wendy Rosen. Wendy is the founder of The Rosen Group, an arts marketing and publishing and advocacy firm that she founded in 1981. In addition, she's the producer of The American Made Show, formerly The Buyer's Market for American Crafts. And she is also the publisher of Niche Magazine. Now, one would think that would be enough. But in addition, she is the author of Crafting as a Business, and she is the founder of a non-for-profit company called the Arts Business Institute. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> nice to yes. see you. I know you've come all the way from ah. Baltimore to visit with us. And yes. You it's were beautiful up here in the fall. It is beautiful. You actually missed a lot of the good foliage, but it's still there. Yeah. And today is a little bit colder than it normally is. Mm -hmm. So you have just come off a kind of charrette where you were with the Arts Business Institute. Right. And tell us a little bit about why you founded that, okay. what it's all about, why it's a non-for-profit, and what do you guys do? Well, um, when my 40th birthday was approaching, I... I don't believe that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> many years ago, many two decades ago, in fact, I said to my husband, I want to do something special. I want to rent Camp Louise and have all my friends come. And so what I did to, to have my birthday party the way I wanted was to create um, a workshop on the business of art and invite all my friends to lecture, and then a whole bunch of brand new artists to come and take advantage of the workshop and the lectures. And it was so much fun that we did it the next year and the next year and the next year, and then we grew to two and three a year, and now Carolyn and I do six or seven or maybe even a dozen workshops a year all over the country for, for arts organizations and universities and um, private art schools and small guilds even. So you just came from one. Right. Tell me a little bit about what that was, where was it, who was in attendance, what did right. you cover? Well, we were doing it for, for Mass MoCA. And Which is, for those people who don't know. Right, is the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. Correct. And <laughs> thank you. I think. <laughs> and then right before that, we were at NECA, the main college of art. Um, and so what we are trying to do is to teach artists, uh, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional artists, craftspeople, fine craftspeople, how to expand their marketplace outside of their local communities. Because in order to be successful as an artist, you need multiple streams of income mm -hmm. and you, you must have multiple price points to work with and different types of work and you know putting that puzzle together to make a good, a good income for yourself where you can raise a family and put the kids in college is not so easy. So we help people through the process of finding those niche markets that they need to become successful. So that leads into the niche magazine. Tell yes. me a little bit about right. what got you started with a magazine. What does it do? Well, niche magazine was created after we began the Buyer's Market of American Craft, which is a wholesale trade show where artists can connect with galleries and shops and uh, incredible museum stores and catalogs like Sundance. Um, and so, where are they held? They they are held. They were on the East Coast in in uh, Philadelphia, and we had some in Boston for many years, and Springfield, Massachusetts, even. Um, and so, ne the idea with Niche was to take those people who were in the trade show and put them in print during the off season in between the shows, so oh, the retailers okay. would. Pick them up and exactly remember them. would get exactly get more so familiar. So there was only with the one work. show a year, or no, there were as many as three and four shows okay. a year some years. Um, but what has happened in the trade show industry over the last ten years is pretty remarkable. The merger and acquisition of trade shows has driven the cost of doing a trade show in a convention center to an all-time high. Right. And so in order for an artist, a potter for instance, a ceramic artist to think about doing a trade show um, at New in New York or Boston or Chicago or, or LA, they have to consider 
maybe a seven to ten thousand dollar investment. And do they necessarily get that back in sales? Maybe or? not. Uh -huh. And sometimes it takes three years to build up the kind of customer base that you need to be profitable at a, in wholesale. So it's become almost impossible for these artists to break in to wholesaling. And what's sad is that every country in the world subsidizes their small designers to come here to sell. And um, if you're a jeweler, for instance, your buy-in to the couture show is a $30,000 investment. Very few artists can afford right. to do that. If you're a small studio, you just can't afford it. So is this what prompted you to begin to think about the online presence exactly, that we're exactly. talking about? So As tell I us a little yeah. bit about what, well, I'm more interested really before we get into that, mm -hmm. to kind of have our audience understand your elevator pitch. So, hi, I'm Wendy Rosen. What do I do? I mean, you have so many different hats that you wear. Right, right. And normally what I do when I sit down with an artist to go over that is I find out where they are and what their needs are and really what they have been making so that I can see if I have a niche for them to go in. I, and I'll give you some examples of that. I had a potter come to me once and um, he made these gorgeous, gorgeous forms. And I think he wanted me to tell him to go to the big sofa show in Chicago. And I turned to him and I said, I'm not sure your work would sell well at sofa. You're not priced quite high enough. I don't think your values or perceived values could be high enough for sofa. And I, I think you're going to have trouble finding the right gallery. But I can share with you a niche market that will allow you to earn an incredible living and have a following of loyal customers at three times what you're making at a local art fair for so each piece. So this is what every artist or craft person is dying to know. Right. So I sent him off for Japanese flower arranging classes. He was pretty upset at that. But when he got home to his wife and she, she asked him, what did the consultant say? He told her and she said, you're going to take that flower arranging class. He did and he found exactly what he was looking for. So did he then create different types of? No, he was actually creating the same work. You could see that his work was very organic and sensual in, in the forms, and the glazes were just perfect for flower arranging, and I just took a look at the work and said, he might modify things a tiny bit, but he's going to be making work for flower arrangers, and they're willing to pay six or eight hundred dollars for a piece. So did he actually create the floral arrangements or he just pitched to that no, market? He, he, he learned flower arranging so he knew what kinds of vessels ah. to make and then he got involved in the community and then he became the, the, the vessel maker for flower arrangers and he got invited to all the uh, meetings in his region and then eventually he actually went to Japan to the international fairs and festivals for Ikebana to sell his work there. Tell us about some other types of things like that, because I think this is something the audience craves. Right, right. Well, How you know, do you take an artist that's right. doing something and right. reinvent them right. in a way? Well, you know, a lovely little lidded vessel about this big in ceramics or wood. Right to the funeral home. Sells, sells <laughs> for about 70 bucks at an art fair. When it goes to the funeral home, I was kidding. <laughs> no, you are not kidding. It's a five to eight hundred dollars, sometimes a twelve hundred dollar purchase, because there is an emotional attachment. Whenever you can add value in memories, emotional, ritual, you can increase greatly what you can make. That is very interesting. Are there other examples? Because this is fascinating. Well, you know, candlesticks that are going to go on the dining room table are not worth much. But if, if they all of a sudden become part of Jewish ritual, right. they become more valuable, more perceived value. And then how do you reach that market? You go to a trade show that actually... There are specific trade shows for everything. And I think this is what most artists don't understand, is that there's a trade show or there is a community or small group that you can find. And it used to be that you could only find them in trade shows. But today, you can find Online, mailing anything. lists and email lists and community groups for every kind of special interest that's Do you out ever there. recommend a publicist, for example, for an artist? 
most artists that I know um, either have someone local that they use. I often recommend that people use the online um, services that are available, like Gig Salad or Fiverr or some of these wonderful. Um, what was the first one? Well, if you need a virtual assistant that is a specialist in something, um, you can use Gig Salad or gig, Fiverr. Gig mm -hmm. Salad. And I use uh, Indeed is another one for getting, for finding uh, part-time people who are specialists at Come on, more. small tasks. More. My audience wants to know more. <laughs> oh, you can get, you know, I use Grasshopper for answering the phone and, and you know, there are all kinds of services now for solopreneurs. That's or amazing. Or entrepreneurs. Okay, and they're that's... wonderful. Logo design, brochure design. There's no reason to spend a fortune putting together a website because you can find it very, very easily online. All you have to do is you know, find a webmaster that could be anywhere. How do you find a person to do social media? I know that artists ask me that every single day. I don't have time to do Twitter. I don't have time to do Instagram. I don't have time for Fiverr anything. is a place to go for $5. They'll post things for you for a week. It's called F-I- V-E-R-R. Fiverr. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's just a little taste of and what do they write we the teach. content or do you have to actually provide them with the content? A lot of times you have to provide them with keywords and some content and they will massage it and edit it and crop the photos and and all of that and make sure that they'll also put together a system so that things automatically post to that's different things. That's very helpful because that's right. the type of thing that I know artists get very bogged down with. Yes and really the best thing is to just have everything connect to Instagram so that when you take the photograph with Instagram it posts to Facebook, it posts to Pinterest, it posts to um, LinkedIn and, do you and all those other that places. That actually does help promote the artist or do they Absolutely. need to be with influencers? Oh, I know a gallery owner who who was not um, using Instagram and the week that she started using Instagram she put up a photograph of a wall art piece that was six hundred dollars and someone who was about 38 years old walked in with it on their phone and said where's this? Bought really? it right then. It, she hadn't posted it two or three hours earlier. That's unbelievable. Yeah. But you have to get followers, right? Yes, but this was a new account. She, she had just created this Instagram account. That's amazing. So someone was looking locally for interesting things to go see and do and buy, and they found her. Now, I know that you have just launched a brand new venture. I actually haven't launched it yet. Is it a secret, or can we share with the audience? Yeah, yeah I'll share it today. Okay. Okay. So um, it's American made. It's, and it's, it's the an best online. in America. It's, okay. it's the best in American made. And what I have discovered over the last 10 years is that as trade shows got expensive, the best makers left wholesaling. And now that the economy has pretty well recovered, they want to come back. But they want to come back with a tighter line to wholesale and they still want to sell their work, some work online and they want to divide what they do and have different brands and collections. So the only way to do that effectively and affordably is to sell online. And every trade show I visited this last year, traffic such as, such as New York Now, the gift show, um, the jewelry shows, the the Las Vegas Home and Gift, Dallas Home and Gift, um, several other shows that I, I, I was able to get to. Every trade show I visited, traffic was 40% or more down. Wow. Sales were that far down. But if you went and asked the exhibitor, the artist, the studio artist, how are your sales? And they said, well, the show is slow, but the, my sales are even with last year. I'm having no problem selling. It's just all coming in online through my website. Ah. So now we need a way to pull all the website information together so that buyers can shop different brands together as if they were at a show. And, and the other problem for retailers, retailers really struggle to buy at trade shows now because Artists are selling in so many different ways through so many different channels, like Etsy, right, and eBay, and, and First Dibs, and all these other channels. The retailer has to look online and see whether that artist has pricing integrity. Mm -hmm. Pricing integrity is important, and you can't write an order until you know that 
you're not being undercut. Right, because by today the with the internet, you can look up anything. Exactly. Anywhere. So the new website allows a retailer to actually do the research that they need to do to satisfy themselves about pricing integrity, and then they can go and write the order online. So how are you going to get the people that, is this a, a group of people that you know? Yes. Are you putting out a call for artists? I'm how? not yet putting out a call for artists. What we are going to start with are the real best sellers. Those people that retailers rely on for reorders on a regular basis, the kind of work that gets sold every six weeks or every eight works. Can you eight give weeks. us some examples of artists? Well, that one are... would be wooden spoons that go in, or small ceramic items, or $18 earrings. I mean, low end as well as high end. Some of these things actually sell very fast on the show floor. Okay. And they need to be replaced fast and reordered. So that draws the retailer to write those orders more often. So can the people who are exhibiting on the Best in America Made online yes. uh, gallery also exhibit with Etsy? Yes, they can. Okay. They just have to make sure that they are providing their retailer with a full markup so they can't undercut. So if they are selling an item at $15 wholesale or $150 wholesale, that item has to be exactly double online. So how does Best in America make money, how does Etsy make money, how does the artist make money, how does all this right. finance work? Well, a lot of websites charge a listing fee and a, um, a commission, and we don't do any of that. We charge a flat $39 fee for a basic uh, for catalog. For item? No, $39 for your entire showroom of 500 images per month, per, mo per month, okay. over the year. And that can and that can do that. And then we have upgrades where, that include press releases, like you said. And so you will write them? Yes, and we will do outreach them. and one-on-one one -on -one, uh, introductions for retailers. Ooh. All kinds of what wonderful What about a new, let's services. say I decide now. I've right. been a jeweler. I've made jewelry forever. I've sold right. it at little craft shows. I don't have a following. I don't have, I want to get involved in that. Could I? Um, not this year, perhaps next year we would begin adding a few of those people, but what we would encourage you to do first is to go find a local retailer and build a relationship there okay. so, so that you, you have a reference credibility. and credibility and you understand wholesale well enough to be able to launch into a wholesale business. And we, we're going to want to know where you get your supplies and um, what your production processes are so that we can be assured that you are going to fill those orders because anyone who gets three complaints right, that out. are unresolved, they have to leave the, the market. Got it. Do you have any idea of how many people you will have ultimately on this? Because obviously the more the better for We're the We're going retailers. to start with somewhere between 300 and 500, and then I don't think we'll get beyond a few thousand, a couple thousand. We're not going to be like an eBay. So if somebody wants to buy something, a, a regular person on the site, right. can they buy it? Retail? Actually, that's the interesting part, is that the whole wholesale website is going to be cloned into a retail site where the markup already, ex where there are no prices and no brand names of the artwork. And people can go in and choose things, click on them, and then find out what store nearest them carries that item. Ah, okay. So they will learn what retailers in their area carry American made goods. That's perfect. So you're going to have branding in all your stores like yes. Etsy now does. Yes. And it's going to have the American made right. logo on. Yes. And you'll find next year that when you go into stores carrying American made goods and they're proud of it that they'll actually have a window cling and decal that says we're a best in American made retailer. How big an infrastructure does the Rosen Group have? You're one person, you're doing 12 things. How are you doing all this? It's not, it's not easy, but I, like many small companies, have moved from a physical office where I'm supervising a lot of people into a virtual office where I have a team of engineers over here and I have um, uh, copywriters here and I have editors here and photographers there and, and it comes all together very nicely. 
Uh, could you elaborate on that for our audience, please? That <laughs> it's was back, it's back to those that Fiverr and Indeed and seriously, those, you yeah. are able to do all of this yes. using virtual sources. Yes, because I use um, a tool called Basecamp, which allows me to share documents and information with people who then pick it up at their leisure when they want to work on a project for me. That's pretty awesome. It's all project management. Do you think that the years of being in business has helped you to be able to get to this point? You know, I, re I remember thinking back in the 80s how I would have designed my business. I mean, in, in the 80s, you didn't even have a fax machine. Actually, I, I did, but I, I also had an Apple computer. And then I dreamed about how this could all come together and everything tie together. And it's taken 30 years for all of that to actually happen and be real. My first attempt at creating an online marketplace was 20 years ago. And I spent $250,000 doing it and didn't get anything that I could publish. Can I tell you something? Yes. I forget we're on the television, but I did the same thing. Right. In the early 80s, I mm -hmm. started a company called Omnivex, which was the first interactive laser video disc catalog of art, right. which was able, before the internet, which you could share with all of the galleries uh -huh. across the country, and it was digital, it was analog technology. Mm -hmm. And I had $250,000 investor, and right. the company failed because it was analog. Right, it was, things are changing too fast. It, to way too fast. Right, and two years ago, when I started the, I, when I thought of the idea of of going back to this concept of putting the marketplace together, you know, I looked around and it was almost impossible to find the right company to, to do it and do it right. But I finally did find them and they're wonderful to work with and, and uh, we have a great relationship and it's moving along. So what's gonna be after that? Are you gonna retire ever? Well, actually this whole new, you know, I'm kind of in transition from the old Rosen Group, which was an a, a pretty stale business model to this new business model and I think it's going to give me more flexibility and freedom and creative opportunity than I've had in a long time. So you're exciting. very excited, you're very yes, motivated absolutely. and you anticipate that this is going to be where you're going to really focus 90% of your attention. Yes. But what about the Business uh, Institute? Well Carolyn does a great job of She's your executive that. director. Right. Yeah. She runs it out of, uh, out of Florida, and really all I have to do is pack my bags and, and get on the flight that she sends to me to get on, so, and, and then we can go off and do these. In fact, I've got a meeting um, in a week or two with the Embassy of Kenya who would like to talk to us about doing some educational workshops. For this is for the women there? I or? don't know. How did they find you? I was at New York Gift, and I spoke to a couple of Kenyan artists who were there uh, on a trade mission, and they put me in contact with, uh, with the, the consulate. Now, the business that you're running, this Amer Best in American Made, is there going to be educational component to that at all, or is that going to just be as it is an online? I think the Arts Business Institute does a great job of so all of that. going so to that keep them totally separate exactly. and keep Ex it. Yes, yes. And are but you going to continue writing for Niche Magazine? Yes, I will, yeah. And what was your latest publication about? Well, we did a jewelry issue. Well, and actually, was, I actually went on and we read that. Issue, and then we also had um, a, a show issue as well. And, and the summer show issue was all about Dallas Market and new things coming out for uh, the Christmas season because retailers are shopping in the summertime for, for Christmas. For Christmas. For Everything for Christmas has to be delivered in October. Are there any new trends that you're noticing in crafts? Are there new types of crafts that we should learn about? Are there new things, old crafts that are, have a new twist? Are there new colors for the year? I, I think that, what, that our definition of handcraft is changing dramatically, that lasers and um, digital engraving and computer 3D printing are all part of what we still define as, as the art movement or handmade movement. And that, that's becoming something to discuss and in the marketplace, but um, it's, it's important for every artist to be very transparent about their processes and what they're doing. 
we have better art now and better craft now because of all of that equipment. No and the, and the equipment that used to take up a, a huge room or a building, you know, I have a 100,000 square foot artist studio complex back in Baltimore, and, and that used to be a cotton mill, and that's how much space you needed to make cotton. Nowadays, manufacturing equipment fits on a kitchen table. So right. women are involved in manufacturing like never before. And it's amazing to see all this new work coming How out. many of the artists or craftspeople that you know actually farm out work to local people? I'm hearing that there's like a little cottage industry that still exists. Well, it's not just a little cottage industry. It's quite huge. In fact, the website makersrow.com features, I think right now, about 12,000 jobbers that artisans or small manufacturers can job out work to. You have given us more information today. I wish I had my and pencil can, and paper. I can't can, wait to listen to the interview. You can actually upload your diagrams and your CAD drawings and get bids, and it, they're all U.S. manufacturers. That is unbelievable. Uh -huh. What was the name of it again? Makersrow.com. You're a wealth of information. Is there like a 411 number for Wendy Rosen if people want to find you? Actually, I'm one of those rare people who share their phone number all the time. And do you actually consult with artists? Like I, I, I know do. that Carol and Eklund, we, um, Edwin, Edwin that does, we spoke, yes. and yes. And yes, I do too. And we both kind of have our specialties. So if I get a request for a consult and I don't feel as competent as I know Carolyn is with an issue, I will send it to her and she'll do the same. How do you differentiate your specialty, for example? Well, I know that Carolyn has background in licensing and manufacturers repping and, and two-dimensional art that, that I don't have. So she's much more uh, secure in that information. And, um, and, and then my work is mostly in craft and niche markets and things like that. You were never an artist yourself? Actually, I am the daughter of a woman, a, an artist, a wonderful artist. My mother was Mickey Workman, and she drew all of the coloring books that you and I colored in as children. Really? Yeah. Oh, she what a worked, legacy. That's She so worked nice. for Whitman Sawfield. I love it. And I still remember my first art fair at Key Biscayne in Florida back in about, I would say, 1960. I'm very proud of her, I take it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Her work is hanging all over my house. Well, I can't wait to revisit this interview because there's so much information for everybody out there, and I think we're so lucky to have had Wendy here today. I can't thank you enough thank for you coming so all the way from Baltimore. Thank you. Hopefully, I will call you one of these. Come days. visit, and I'll take you to lunch at the American Visionary Art Museum. Sounds perfect. Thank you thank so you. much. So nice.